car. This is Brenda. How can I help you? Is Richard there? Yeah, he's here. I think uh, Jason Chapman? Yes. Hi, sir. Yeah, he's expecting your call. Let me go get him. Give me one second, okay? Sounds good. Thanks. Hi, Jason. Hey, Richard. This is Jason and John Chapman. Hey, how you doing? John. How's it going? It's too nice out. Is it too nice out? All right, well, let's. Nice. I'm sorry to report it. <laughs> <laughs> Look outside. Well, Richard, we're calling to see if you would be interested in being on the podcast. Oh, I guess so. When do you want to do it? Uh, soon. Okay, I'll look forward to it. All right. Stay cool. <laughs> Hi guys, how's it going? It's good, good uh, to see you again. That was probably the don't, most energetic I've ever been. Don't come here with that energy. <laughs> Whoa. Right, everybody just thinks how happy John is and they think I'm a downer, so I'm trying something new. <laughs> okay. But you are a downer. <laughs> oh, what was that? Are you trying to be John? John? Is he trying to make John. fun of me? No. Uh, ouch. Giggle, giggle. I'm emulating you. That's giggle. like the highest level of com- or a compliment. Yeah. yeah. Form of flattery. Wow, I appreciate no. that very, very much. No, I, I'm pretty excited about uh, being back together. Not because of you guys, but uh, getting to do another podcast. The podcast is officially launched. Um, it's well, one getting rave so. reviews. By now, this is uh, what six or seven episodes in. We're obviously at the top of the charts. Yeah, of course. Um, who doesn't want to watch out? We're not right now. Months. We're not right now yet. But by the time this airs, yeah. we will be. We're yeah, probably so I'm on, excited on like about that. Leno or something, if he's still yeah. on air. Look out there. He's uh, not. Yeah, Jeremy. Team Leno's. Coco. <laughs> Leno's, yeah. yeah. Conan O'Brien, he thinks he's the king of podcasts. But the funny thing is, I was, a, <laughs> I was one of the secret guests on uh, Smartless because of this podcast. So is that oh, true? Really? That's when you know you've made it. Hmm. Yeah, that's not true at all. Anyway, welcome back, back to the podcast, Jeremy. Thank yeah. you. You guys been doing anything uh, interesting? Uh, not that the viewers would want to uh, know about, but I, I've been building a retaining wall to put a swimming pool on it. Yeah. Mm. And growing that growth on your face? Yes. By the time this is out there, uh, my live feed should show a massive mustache right now. <laughs> it's in its infancy, and uh, it's, I've been watering it it's every day. I was going to say, Jeremy's le- like literally found some sort of miracle grow for mustache, I, I would assume. Un- it's very unfortunate. Look. <laughs> it is very unfortunate. Jealousy does not suit you guys well. <laughs> I have never Why is this? Can you explain it to me? Yeah. Is there a is reason why you decided about? to do this? Uh, it's just the, the cool thing to do. The cool thing to do. No. No, it's not. <laughs> anyway. I like it. I guess I, moving uh, on since you don't for have For all you people reason. that are listening to the podcast, I have a glorious mustache glorious. right now. Glorious. Uh, let me describe it to you. It no. is about uh, <laughs> one and a half inches from the center lip on each side. Really? Um, comes down just a little bit below the bottom lip. It's just stubble right now. Um, I've noticed a little bit more gray in it than I expected, <laughs> but still quite glorious. It seems glorious. to me you're growing I think slower I that than picture you used to. Very well. Yeah, I don't know what it is. You're unhealthy or something. Vitamins. You I used think. to used to grow within a week. It just you'd doesn't have a look beard. as like full if it's just the mustache. If I think if you had the beard, it, it looks. Yeah, yeah. Man, I don't think so. I guess whatever. Anyway, um, guys, I'm excited about this episode. A uh, very cool that we're getting. The whole goal of this show was to talk to people that were part of influencing right in it. and <laughs> creating <laughs> I love how we, the world. We went, from, we went from mustache of Jeremy to let's talk I'm about this mustache <laughs> podcast. <Wow. laughs> Only speak to Is other this? mustachioed individuals. Speaking of transitions, <laughs> but seriously. Uh, what? Okay, guys, <laughs> what is the purpose of this can show? We, can we can we come up with a segue, please? Um, does Richard have a? He's mustache? got a glorious beard. Speaking of glorious beard, beard he does have a beard. beard. You're giving away the entire guest, Jay. Um, <laughs> the purpose of this podcast is to talk he, to. I think it's on the title Jared, screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think you get the get how no, this, this works. How smart they this they works. see the name of. They see the name of it on the podcast when they're looking. (laughs) Oh, I should listen to this episode, which says (laughs) Richard Hoover is on the podcast today. Right. That is how we make a transition. Richard Hoover <laughs> yeah, of Santa Cruz Guitars. Pay uh, what do you have to say? He's our special guest. And that, what I was trying to say is the purpose of this podcast is we're <laughs> going to talk to people that help shape the acoustic world and in acoustic guitars and especially in the boutique guitar Absolute building. Legend, I don't know that there's many more out there. No. I mean, there's like this no. top pantheon of builders and the guys that are most respected. Does anybody even know the top what of pantheon is? Um, I think it was like a, a place in Rome. <laughs> 
Isn't that the, the cologne on uh, on uh, Anchorman? <laughs> Panther. <laughs> you guys it smells are, like gasoline. <laughs> you guys are taking this away. It smells like pure gasoline. <laughs> it burns the nostrils. Oh, it? It's a formidable scent. <laughs> anyway. Santa Cruz guitars. It's embarrassing that Richard's going to be on it now. <laughs> we anyway. have really set this up for him so well. Uh, I would. I, I I'm would looking forward to this conversation, this. though. Uh, yeah, John. I'm a huge. John's here. got a chance. Uh, a to huge fan. Talk to him a little bit more than I have, just because they're guitar people, and John owned one of yeah. the guitars. But I've always uh, admired two? Richard, and uh, very excited to have him on the podcast. Yes. He had to brave the the awful traffic. The I one. The I one. I think Highway they call one. it Highway One. The one. Everybody, you take the one to the five, the five to the, the four, four, and, and the then you take the one oh nine to the to four oh nine <laughs> to the formula. You guys would make a great anyway. Google Maps voice. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Richard Hoover. I'm very excited to talk to him. Let's do this thing. Right. Take me away, cause I can be the way. Let somebody want to let go, and I can have my way. Well, we are very proud to have you on the show. Uh, this is Richard Hoover. Uh, it's owner a podcast, and, John, it's not a, a show. show it's a podcasty show. <laughs> showing the podcast. <laughs> it is good to have him on here. This is one of my heroes and a, a very, very smart and uh, and very kind fellow. You guys, one thing I want to point out about this before we get into this, and Richard, uh, please bear with me trying to embarrass you. This is probably one of the kindest people in the music industry. He, like, he's always been su- super nice, right? Yeah. Like, and here's what blows my mind. Every time I've come up to him, which I only see him like, it had been probably 10 years, hadn't seen him at all, and introduced, and he's like, yeah, I remember you. We talked about this and that, and, and I don't know how you do that. How do you do that kind of memory? Um, well, let's just cut to the quick here and I'll, I'll be a little anecdotal when i started out in the business uh, all the music store owners and everybody was my dad's age and you know uh my principles based on my faith are that you know you do business the same way you lead your personal life and we have the rules set out for us we know what to do you know uh, uh you pay kindness forward life is good you make the world a better place and you succeed and everybody told me yeah 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 you know you kids we, i was like that when i was a kid but you'll get your butt kicked you'll learn how to uh, uh, make a profit and you'll learn that nice guys finish last. So uh, 47 years later, at 72 years old, I've proven that it works. <laughs> yes. And nobody teases me about it anymore. Uh, the trade show concept is ridiculous to practice social skills. Um, you, you know, I might see uh, 4,000 people. Yeah. Um, I don't have good memory retention. I'll recognize a face, but what was the context? What was their name? But what I learned to do at that show is rather than try to do everything, whoever comes up and talks to me is the most important person in the world. And I don't, I look at them, I don't look elsewhere because if I do, I'll be distracted and I'll, it'll seem like I'm looking for somebody more important to talk to. What a great point. Uh, and for you in particular, uh, I just, I, I just, you know, you resonated from the beginning, not only as a genuine person, <laughs> uh, uh, honest, straightforward, brave, clean, reverent, but my kind of guy. And you're not easy to forget. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. I've tried. Yeah. Everybody tries. That's not a. <laughs> I, I've got to say, if, uh, this podcast we're all about good advice. That's one of my my pet peeves is when you are talking to somebody, and especially at a trade show or a concert or something like like that, you finally get up there to talk to them, and they're constantly looking over your shoulder like there's got to be someone more important <laughs> to talk to you right now. Which yeah, that's just maybe you. that's just me when I reproach people. They kind of I, I, I put I, them in that I, mood. Yeah, they have higher value than you. That's not very warming at all. No, it? not at all. No, <laughs> I, I agree with that. A hundred percent, I agree. I am the most important. Never mind. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so when was the first time you met Richard? I'm trying to remember so the history. Of- I didn't meet him face to face until it was a NAM show. A NAM show has been my connection with with you, I think, every time. But I remember we talked years and years ago. I started out by playing a Santa Cruz guitar. My first 
well, it wasn't my first guitar, but it was my first like big guitar. This was the guitar that was going to end it all and change the world. And it did. It changed it for me for a long time. was a Tony Rice model. I had dreamt of uh, doing of playing one. I played a few at a, a few music stores. And mine was built in January of 1990. And I think by 93, I got a hold of it. And then uh, got in contact with you guys, uh, and you were actually, this is, again, a very cool thing. In getting co- uh, in touch with the company, I actually got to talk to this man, the head of the, the whole system, which is just amazing. And then uh, ever since then, he took care of me. He talked to me about uh, the guitar when it needed to be worked on or any of that kind of stuff, and it was awesome. And then <clears throat> many, many years later, we went to a NAMM show for the first time, and that's where I met you for the very first time. It's, isn't that a beautiful thing? The NAMM show, you know, we lost it for a few years due to COVID, and it was really, I felt a, uh, I was missing important nutrition because <laughs> uh, we developed friendships with people that we only see once a year. Uh, and that continuity is beautiful. I watch people's kids grow up in photographs, and uh, um, I'm glad to know you, man. That's, that's an honor. And then we talked recently, um, I think this is a really cool story, and uh, I, I, I hope we can share it with everybody. We were talking a couple years back, I have another guitar that is called the Vintage Artist, and the story behind the Vintage Artist, uh, which he clarified for me, I knew it was based on working with Doc Watson, but I didn't know all the details of that. So tell us how that kind of came about. Oh, man. Well, um, uh, Doc, uh, you know, could I consider him a friend? Uh, kind of like we're friends, <laughs> you know. Uh, we uh, we share a lot of values. We share a lot of interests. We have a lot of commonality and a lot of history. And uh, um, uh, I didn't talk to him for business. I talked to him for, you know, uh, uh, he was real a mentor. You know, he's been through a lot and he's learned a lot. And when we wanted to make a, uh, a D18 uh, style guitar uh, with, uh, you know, we're bad counterfeiters, so we always want to do improvements, bring it up into contemporary uh, era, but we wanted to do a pre-war D18, like we do uh, with the Tony Rice model, because some people could say is a tribute to an old D28. So I called Doc to ask him about his opinions, his ideas about what uh, he liked, because I knew he was a mahogany fan. So Doc said, um, there's a couple things that aren't common knowledge. He said, I spend a lot more hours on a Les Paul than I have on a Dreadnought uh, playing in rockabilly bands and whatever it took uh, to put bread on the table uh, as a blind man as a kid. And he said, and I love the jumbo frets, so let's, let's start there. But mahogany is my choice because it's just more articulate. You know, uh, 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 a little myth busting. The woods don't contribute to bass or treble. They contribute to bright or dark, the scale of tone. And what he liked about the mahogany, it was super versatile. It wasn't too warm to lose an articulate uh, presence, and it wasn't too bright to be edgy or harsh. And so uh, that's why the D18. But here I know where you're headed with this story. Is um, So we built the prototype, and I sent it to Doc, uh, you know, not as a solicitation for him to buy it or play it, but, you know, to follow up on this and get his opinion of the final product and he said uh, in essence um, he said you know this is uh, I don't want to be self-serving here but he says this is more uh, more like the guitar that fits my style than any I've played and uh, um, I, I you know and he gave me some other things that were great uh, quotes to put in, in promotion of magazines. And then I said, Doc, I can't tell you how appreciative of your time with this. And I'll make, I'll send a pickup uh, so you don't have to do anything. Um, uh, just the guitar will go in a box and a, and a label and it'll all be taken care of. And there's a really long silence. <laughs> and he said, he said, Richard, what I need to do to keep this guitar? And I went, wow. Um, the, uh, 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 well, sure, <laughs> you know, you're welcome to it. And then Doc says, I'd like you to call this the Doc Watson model. And I went like, oh dear. Uh, Don Gallagher, Gallagher Guitars, mm-hmm. is a friend of mine. And I felt if, if we put Doc's name on one of our guitars, it would be akin to asking his wife out on a date. <laughs> 
you know, I just couldn't reconcile that. And I said, I told Doc that, and he laughed. He thought that was hilarious. And he and he said, Oh, as you will, but you can always tell people, you know, I believe in you and go with God and so forth. So we named that guitar the Vintage Artist as a thinly disguised euphemism for Doc. And uh, and uh, there you go. What a, what a gent. Um, what a true. Uh, good man, and I'm sorry we lost him. Oh, yeah, him. absolutely. Just an absolute pioneer of uh, the guitar world, and also just an amazing talent uh, yeah. all the way around, which is really, really cool. I've been listening to a lot of Doc Watson lately, and that model is really cool, too. For those of you who have never seen one, it is a uh, white-bound uh, mahogany guitar, so it has, you know, it does, like you said, it has some of the uh, bits and pieces of a uh, D18 style, but it also has a uh, herringbone trim, uh, uh, I think even a herringbone rosette, if I remember right. I have one. I just haven't paid attention to those details as much as I yeah, have to. Well, maybe, uh, I, I might have a little bit of an hybrid and violin purfling rosette, but nonetheless, you know, it's a uh, stylistically it's a tribute to the old days. And like a lot of our guitars, it's a Trojan horse. It's familiar, friendly, embraceable on the outside, and the dangerous stuff is on the inside. <laughs> the I agree. It's a fabulous made. guitar. I enjoy it. It's actually my dad's. Um, he plays it every once in a while, but then I took it on the road quite a bit uh, as w when we were younger as well. So, The Acoustic Shop Knows People is brought to you by the fine folks at The Acoustic Shop. There's fine people over there. Have you guys ever heard of a mandolin? If so, you should already be in the car driving to The Acoustic Shop. If not, you should be on the World Wide Web searching up theacousticshop.com. If the answer is no, then you should go listen to a mandolin, then get back to step one and continue through the rest of the steps. As always, please drive safe. I followed up on you quite a bit, and uh, I didn't realize that you actually worked with Daryl Anger building mandolins before really starting Santa Cruz Guitar Company. Oh, dear. You didn't read that thing about Thailand in 1938, did you? <laughs> I did, but we're not going to be able to talk about that in the <laughs> podcast. So, uh, yeah. Um, Daryl is still a real dear friend and uh you know daryl was uh we <laughs> the story is i i you know i was working in my garage my old barn home shop and i used to ride my bike up to uh the deli each day to get you know sandwich and lunch and get a break and ride back and i rode past this old victorian where the basement is half above ground and half below so there's windows at the ground level and there was mandolin parts hanging in there and i went and knocked <laughs> on the door and nobody was there and i did that several days in a row till finally a uh, dare lance at the door and there was this cooperative of guys building uh, F5 copies, um, uh, uh, and uh, that was Daryl, David Morris, and a couple other guys. And I said, wow, this is cool. Um, uh, can I help? Um, I was building guitars already, but it just seems so neat. And, you know, I'm really a fan of when God puts something on my doorstep, I just go, okay, I'll do this too. And uh, 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 they invited me in, and I worked with Daryl for some time and building, again, F5 copies and uh, 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 doing inlay and things like that. And then Daryl was got a call to go try out for a new band in Mill Valley. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and the concept was these were guys that were using traditional bluegrass instruments to do a really contemporary uh, uh, style of string music influenced by, uh, you know, uh, Django, Grappelli, uh, Brazilian, and uh, the guy that was ahead of the band was um, uh, David Grisman. Daryl had to, okay, I'm going out to you know make a name for myself. Good luck, and um, uh, we stayed friends. Uh, you know, about the time I went, you know what? I can't learn fast enough by myself. Plus, I'm going. I get cabin fever working in the shop by myself. If I got together with a group of other people, we could accelerate our learning curve. I'd have more fun, and uh, that's what I want to do. And we started Santa Cruz Guitar. Company, mm -hmm. so uh, this, we, she, we started that in September of '76. So only a few months later, uh, Daryl said, "Hey, can I bring the guitar player from the band down 
to meet you. <laughs> and, and, and of course, so Daryl and Tony came to my house and uh, uh, Tony, like, look, I, I wasn't, I didn't follow bluegrass, mostly the old stuff. So, I, you know, I didn't know who Tony was. And, uh, but I went like, geez, he really can play guitar for a bluegrass. <laughs> you know, this is He's great. all right. And the conversation, yeah, the conversation led to this. And please, this is a great chance for me to demystify the Tony Rice model and debunk some myths. Uh, we get faulted all the time because our Tony Rice not a true copy of the old E28, but it was never meant to be. Tony, what Tony said is that, yeah, I got this old herringbone, you know, and it works, but I'm doing these jazz phrasings and things like that. And it's really like this big, boomy bass, uh, uh, bassy rhythm machine. And I need more clarity in mid range and travel to do these uh, phrasings. And he said, you know, uh, I'm more, you know, I spend more time with uh, Coltrane and old RCA Jerry Reed recordings than I do with bluegrass stuff. And uh, uh, when to get the treble right now, I got to play really close to the bridge. And you've seen his technique, and he does a marvelous job of making that uh, uh, revered old herringbone articulate. But he wanted one where he didn't quite have to put that effort in. However, he wanted the look that he's familiar with. And he talked about his relationship to the instrument and the visuals and the vibe. And we went really deep on it. And in the, from the very beginning, I didn't want to be the next Martin. I wanted to make custom guitars for artists. And the difference is you don't make a guitar and try to convince an artist it's right. You listen carefully to them to be able to get the cosmetic the sound, the playability, and uh, so there's a, there's the introduction to Tony, and he said, "Sure, let's let's you know make me a guitar," and uh, there's you know the rest is history. But over our career, we probably did maybe nine plus guitars for him, developing as we went for not only uh, his idea of sound and playability, but to accommodate his repetitive stress. I know that's more than you asked, but I couldn't help. No, I love try it. To get that point across. Never intended to make a Martin tribute. Quite the contrary. Again, it was a Trojan horse. It had to look like an old Martin. But you know, that guitar was so modified <laughs> that uh, it, it really departed from that. And we'll talk about that another time, about the history of the modifications to that old hair. And we got us a miss on that, too. <laughs> yeah, that's very, very cool. I, now, here's where I'm curious, because I had a chance to purchase one of the original uh, prototypes. Oh, that's awesome. The one I got the chance to do, and I passed on it, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I passed on the one that was a cedar top. How many were, were those? Yeah, Just and that was the prototype. So here, okay. here is some um, the thinking. It comes from the classical tradition. Uh, people use cedar to have the guitar sound uh, uh, older, uh, less edgy, warmer, uh, but it's still but still be articulate, and it's also uh, uh, fraught with um, uh, negative uh, uh, connotations. Oh, cedar! The tunnel life has only last fifty years, or whatever you might have. But uh, <laughs> it actually, it worked. Um, sure. And that guitar really. Uh, suited his purpose. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go back one. The first guitar we built from him was a prototype. And, and you know, hubris, especially as a young man, is like, I thought I knew better than this hillbilly. <laughs> so I built a guitar I thought he would like. And this is my biggest lesson in what's wrong in a, as a custom builder. And it was more evenly balanced in the EQ, uh, less predominant bass, you know, good mid-range and treble and so forth. And he just went, no. <laughs> no, that's not right. So, we, But then we begin the process of, of refination, of talking about what was right, what was wrong, and working over the years and, and progressively dialing in the guitar that was right for him. But that cedar top guitar uh, proved uh, a lot of that uh, folklore about cedar absolutely wrong. And it turns out that that was a uh, thing amongst the classical builders. I think it was Ramirez that did the uh, cedar top and blew everybody away. And the other, other builders went, yeah, that's untraditional. It's no good. It won't last very long. You know, crack. But 
Anyway, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I like that the, the Daryl Anger story led to you know that that circumstance of you walking by a window, going in and talking to him led eventually to that Tony Rice collaboration. I think stories like that are incredible, and I I also uh, understood that in that process of really refining it after Tony uh, said no to the first iteration, that's when you did a little bit more studying or, or talking with some other builders about the effect of the large sound hole and then kind of readjusting the way you build the guitar based on the, the sound hole size. Is that correct? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> but thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, lead in. Uh, and uh, I don't speak from a position of pride or hubris here. It's physics. Uh, when Tony asked for the big sound hole, uh, well, actually, really, he wanted it to look just like his guitar, including sure. the enlarged sound hole, which, by the way, was never done with any intent of improvement of sound or whatever. It wasn't done by Martin. Uh, it was happenstance. But the physics of it are, which is what I went to find out, I went to find out in acoustic physics what happens when you make a big sound hole. And what I what I read was Hermann Helmholtz, who was a uh, uh, you know revolutionary acoustic physicist in the first part of the last century, and he did a whole well-published study on the size of apertures in resonating chambers, and he used these bottles with, uh, with, with wider or narrow necks and, and openings, and what happened, and, and the, the real science, contrary to all the uh, uh, internet folklore, is that when you increase the aperture on a resonating chamber, it lowers, uh, I'm sorry, when you increase the aperture, it raises the fundamental chip pitch of the air chamber and it promotes mid-range to treble. When you make it smaller, it, it uh, uh, becomes lower and it promotes bass. Totally counterintuitive. But that's, I went, oh, I get it. This is perfect for our goal here, which is to sure. make a guitar that is big, uh, loud, but articulate, not, um, uh, you know, I've had people describe the old herringbones as a little woolly or woofy, uh, and, and they, were, they were meant to be a, a, the drums in a, a, a band, the rhythm, and to get really articulate treble, like I said, you have to manipulate that. So the larger sound holes served our purpose in, in accentuating the mid-range and treble in a guitar that already has plenty of bass because of its size. So that's a mouthful, but um, it was science and physics, not the opinions of others that that <laughs> led us to that, uh, making it okay to do in a large sound hole. And still today, you go on the internet and say that or death if that if that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting, and I'm sure you guys run across this with you experimenting so much with the way you build and kind of using the scientific method in your building process um, to kind of learn what changes make to it. Because we'll have people argue with, oh, a cutaway yeah. to a guitar makes zero difference to the tone of a guitar. Or, you know, it, they don't understand that changing any part of that sound chamber is going to affect the physics and the, the tone in some way of that instrument. Great. Um, that you're absolutely right. I'll, here's a quick myth buster. Um, you know, if you had an air chamber, it's going to uh, uh, the bigger it is, probably the more volume and the more bass. The smaller it is, the less volume, the less bass. And so that's why in smaller guitars, we use a smaller sound hole to boost bass at, or scallop the braces. But back to the point with this is, if you do a what's called a a uh, Florentine cutaway, a pointy cutaway, not yeah. only are you removing the negative space of the cutaway, but you're removing that area of the pointed cutaway because it's like a blind corner. Um, air doesn't move in there. So you're taking double out and it will decrease volume and it will bring the bass down in the EQ. Not a ton, but enough to be noticeable. If you do the Venetian cutaway, which is the rounded cutaway, you do lose the airspace of the uh, the negative space of the cutaway, but you still maintain the air movement and the airspace of the rounded cutaway. That's why we don't do a pointy cutaway. We only do the rounded cutaways. And there's other ways to mitigate that too. We can take a, a, a guitar and increase the depth front to back by a quarter of an inch and we regain that airspace again. So it's the difference between taking a, a, a production guitar, modifying it, losing something, and the custom, being able, custom builder being able to compensate 
for that change. Um, you have been part of a uh, a crew of legendary builders. You've been doing this for quite some time, and there's been a bunch of you. And what I also get a kick out, we talked about Nam early earlier, is a lot of these guys get together and kind of yeah. get you know. And there's always this opportunity to watch you guys start talking about tone wood. I, like to, see, I like to think that there's like a secret handshake or there something. There is. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee I get it. Get together these <laughs> secret clubs. And- <laughs> But uh, who were some of your, uh, I know you did a lot based on violin, uh, you know, techniques and that kind of stuff in your building, but who were the people that were kind of forming you as far as a uh, luthier and builder? Because there's a lot of people that you were hanging around. The hive uh, mind. Yeah, the hive mind of guitar building at that time. Yeah. Uh, Most of the people that influenced me earlier you've never heard of because they were ahead of the curve. Um, uh, Max Kreml, uh, uh, Michael Dresner, um, uh, and I could go on and on, but I fear leaving somebody out. Brilliant people that chose guitar making, uh, but there was no there there. Uh, there wasn't a market, there was no appreciation uh, for that, and they had to get real jobs to feed their babies and pay their student loans. <laughs> um, who was the biggest influence on me uh, at that time is uh, I started on my own blindly because there was no information on, uh, there was no books on steel string guitars, heaven's sakes, there was no internet. Only thing that was available was violin. And that was a wealth of knowledge of, of how to control the sound of an instrument as opposed to the steel string, which is loud enough. You don't have to really worry about sophistication as a uh, folk instrument or a way to win a girlfriend. You know, you're okay. You don't have to have uh, the violin sophistication. So it was a huge benefit that I, I studied in that and just assumed everybody wanted a really sophisticated sounding instrument and the builder wanted control of all the things that would be on your sound system. Uh, anything you can use a knob or slider to adjust means it's your choice, no right or wrong. And then there's the fundamentals, which is sustained uh, rich, full sound from complexity of overtones. And the violin tradition uh, works really hard to do that. The seal string tradition, nah. People are mostly copying dimensions and styles and things like that. So not to dismiss sure. other builders, but there really wasn't an example out there. I mean, seriously, when I started out, um, uh, there was enough of a network that I probably knew uh, 95% of the people that had made guitars or tried to make guitars, unlike today. So, uh, we, you know, we're not the first of anything because of the, the you know, God-given simultaneous discovery. You know, Edison didn't invent the light bulb, but he got the glory, you know. It popped up around the world when the time was right. So I don't claim to have invented anything, but we're the pioneers of the Bochik concept. And at that time, Martin Gibson made steel string guitars, not humans. So uh, there really wasn't anything to reach out for until like the Guild of American Luthiers popped up and began to get a network and a forum and discovered each other. So here's where I'm going to pause and say my mentors, you know, I found out in building that uh, James Patterson, who wrote the first book on Pearl Inlay, uh, was down the street. He had a full-time job, but he'd learned how to make copies of Martins. And I, uh, Um, I uh, rode my bike over his house and knocked on the door and and made a lifetime friendship with him. The other one was Bruce McGuire, who was a co-author to Art Overhalser on uh, classical guitar making. Art was a a great old coot up in Chico that (laughs) taught a class at Chico State. Uh, Bruce was his neighbor, and Bruce learned from him. And Bruce was also gracious to bring me in and uh, you know, show me how to do it. That's another story. My guitar was stolen. Bruce was a loan officer, and he, uh, when I found his guitar maker, I told him, well, "Is Wednesday good night to come over and learn from you?" <laughs> so Bruce was really gracious. But here's the is that both of them, when I ask them, how can I pay you back? Can I, like, uh, paint your barn? Can I make a fence? You know, what, what? And both of them said a version of this. They said, "Uh, no, just pass this on to others in the same spirit we gave it to you. And that's where... Uh, along with the principles of my faith, my dedication to being open source and sharing information 
with others came from, and I attracted like-minded people, and uh, that rising tide raised all boats, and it's been a great thing to be part of. That's awesome. Absolutely. So Santa Cruz has gone from making standard models to now being a full-on just custom shop now. And that's kind of changed your kind of overall outlook. Uh, you know, all you guys do now are one-off style. I mean, they're all based on models that you guys have done in the past. Um, but now you're just building custom guitar, which I, I find to be very interesting. Oh, it's a blast. Yeah, it's a blast. Now here's the irony is that we started as a custom shop building guitars that players to get, again, cosmetics, playability, sound, all, every uh, neck shape, all in one, the right guitar for a player. But it was like a chain letter. We made a guitar for our best friend and his best friend and his yeah. best friend, and pretty soon you run out of steam, right? So to survive in, in like a non-existent market for boutique guitars, we had to build, uh, again, our dangerous stuff on the inside of the voicing and tuning and control of sound, but in really familiar packages and affordable packages. So an OM or a Dreadnought in Indian Rosewood and Sitka Spruce, just to get guitars sold to keep the doors open. And my goal was to use that as a means to an end until we could work back to the one-of-a-kind custom. And it took years and years and years and years just for economic uh, reasons to get there. And finally now we're back to our roots and our beginning, having learned a lot on the way. So it's been a great ride. It's always a highlight of the, the NAMM show is to go by the Santa Cruz booth because you do such custom things that you, you experiment with things that I don't know that any other guitar builder really thinks about it at a time where there's prehistoric woods that are, you know, from the, the era of the dinosaur. And, and, yeah. and you, you guys just, you try different things out and see what you can come up with. Do you have any of those big leaps of faith that you try out that just does not pan out, that does not turn out to be a great guitar? Do they, you find a way to make it a, a Santa Cruz level instrument? Yeah, yes we do, but not at the customer's expense. You know, we don't go, oh great, we'll try this wood and sell it to this poor sap. It's more like we'll do that internally <laughs> and do prototypes, check it out, see what happens. But I've got, you know, I've got such a great network of professionals and, and the internet. Um, I, can, I can know for certain that a wood's appropriate before we build with it, as far as durability, stability, uh, things like that. And then we find out how to work it most appropriately to get the best sound. So we don't take a chance with our clients, but we're constantly doing R&D. And there's things that are beyond the scope of this, but what people don't see in our company is, is like, you know, cutting edge research where I work with uh, uh, universities, acoustic programs, the military for heaven's sakes, because they're up against the same thing. You know, they shoot a Scud missile or a rocket into space. They have to have complete control of the resonance or it'll shake apart. And with that, we've been able to come up with a real cutting edge uh, evaluation of tone woods to put my 50 years of experience in evaluating a piece of wood into a scientific vocabulary and be able to measure it. And you know what we've done with strings. We didn't want to come up with a, a, a rebranding of a string. We wanted a string worthy of putting on our quality of guitars. And, and it took 20 years and a lot, a lot of help again from science but it, it it's not a boast it's just like it's just better um and we'll continue sure. to do that with a lot of different things and that sounds a little self-emotional but i wanted to fit that in is like no. the spirit of what we're doing with guitars we can we can um uh, uh, extrapolate into the other areas and be of service the most important thing is we don't stretch so thin that we dilute our credibility or I just burn out from trying to do it all. Sure. Which which brings me to my next question is, when are you coming back to building the mandolin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah what a beautiful machine. Um, yeah. We, uh, we um, 
uh, I always wanted to do this because I love the archtop mandolin. Uh, it's, it's just, like I said, it's a beautiful machine. And, um, uh, 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 you know, we're blessed with some pretty arcane knowledge here through my network. I've got uh, typewritten notes or copies of typewritten notes from Lloyd Lore on on his experimentation and what he did in it, and it fits really well uh, with my experience and other information I've had. So I have no doubt we could make a superior, uh, like F five style mandolin, or my favorite, an A style. It's just plain economics. Yeah. And and our our, our ethics. I got to keep bread on the table for twenty families, and I can't really risk that flow of revenue for you, Jerry. If, if I was to follow my and invest in the mandolin building, um, uh, I could, it might be at the expense of our very survival. Now, there's been other people very successful that, and when we, you know, back in the '90s, when we were doing developing our mandolin arch top uh, octave mandolin uh, stuff, we made prototypes that I'm really, really proud of. But at the same time, a huge recession hit. Um, other companies began to spread into those, and it diluted our advantage of being first, if you will, and we'd be kind of me too. And I didn't yeah. want people to think that we were straight from our prime directive, which is to make the best acoustic guitar possible. So it's kind of a complicated paradigm there. I just felt it wasn't the right thing to do to put our efforts in that. For the future, yeah. Um, one of the problems being a boy is I still think at 72 that like when I get around to it, I'll do that Tour de France, you know? <laughs> um, you know, or play me. Me too, by the way. <laughs> I think, you know, if you, if you get bored, you could just make a, a one-off for me. I'll take it. Uh, yeah. Well, keep me, keep me uh, excited about that because, you know, the company is way bigger than just great talent base and there's people that that tug on my elbow all the time hey can we do this can we do this can we do this and uh you know uh my god-given run is I'm, I'm seeing my sunset years so who knows what we'll do in the future and my legacy is to try to keep open field running for my successors to maybe do those kind of things and expand so thanks for the inspiration <laughs> he may have just uh, made that happen again, Jer. Awesome. <laughs> th this podcast is making a difference. <laughs> That's wonderful. So you you personally, Richard, what guitar are you most excited about? Body shape, body style, what is it that gets you the most excited about guitars? Cool. Well, that's a fair question, and but I'll add this caveat. My personal um, uh, preferences are that my personal preferences. So yes, absolutely. Uh, it's 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 really a foul try to make the best guitar in the world because everybody needs something different. The bluegrass player needs a different EQ than the jazz player, et cetera, et cetera. So there's truly no best. Um, except when it comes to qualities of sound, like sustain, complexity of overtones, that come from effort. So back to me, um, I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> always. I grew up with a real cowboy ethos. It's all ingrained in me. Um, I, uh, I, I, love, uh, uh, I love the design concept, uh, the folksy, uh, simple elegance, and uh, the H13 is, I feel, the guitar that over the years I've designed based on my own preferences. And it looks like a real guitar. You know, both the uh, 14 fret Dreadnought OM are really funky designs because they took a pretty uh, body shape and they squashed it from the 12th fret to the 14th and it, it looks like a box. But the H model is this beautiful uh, uh, rounded shape, fits more the golden mean in design and it's really friendly. So uh, we, we did a couple of tricks. Um, that body size would have been a really big guitar back in the turn of the last century. But today it's a small body and people want more volume, more bass. So here's the trick. We took that, that uh, body shape and we, and we made it deeper, which added more. It had the same footprint as a small guitar, but it added more airspace. And as we talked about before, the additional airspace increases the bass and the EQ and makes it louder.
We also did the 13 fret uh, because a longer scale has more tension to bring to pitch. That makes it louder. But at the 14 or 12 fret version, the bridge was in an inefficient place to drive the top. So, but at 13 fret, it's in the sweet spot. So that's another thing to make a small guitar, have a larger presence, a better bass presence. And then um, uh, finally with that, it's braced to give it a very specific EQ. So think about this. If you have a guitar that's super bassy, um, you know, a, a jazz or classical player would hate that because uh, it gets in the way of what their expression. They want an even EQ to be able to truly uh, do what they want as far as volume and, and the different ranges. So this is designed to be slightly bass predominant um, but not so much that it keeps it from being able to play, play all kinds of styles. And I'm, I'm a mess in my style. I'll, I'll play, I'll play <laughs> old uh, Joseph Spence, Trinidad, Corso, swing, jazz, folk, uh, you know, whatever I can pull off. And I want a guitar that has that versatility. You know, it's not good for one, bad for another. It's really self-contained. And did I say it looks really cool? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, it looks like a cowboy's that's, guitar. That's important, too. I think what's really cool about what you're doing is that you have taken things and your passion of the guitar and and also the study of, of music and the science and all that kind of stuff and put it into something that we've all, you know, me, myself, uh, definitely kind of grew up just being in love with and being part of my, uh, my sound. I think that's what I want to thank you for more than anything was that guitar, the uh, first Tony Rice one for me, was the thing that I really got to tr create who I was going to be as a guitar player. And not only that, but had you as a person to kind of talk to about it and be a supporter of it. And that made it even that much more personal for me. And I want to thank you for that. I think that is a, uh, a very ad ad admirable thing. And uh, again, I just, I absolutely cherish the friendship that we have had over the uh, last years. Um, I still want to eventually get you to check a, take a look at that guitar to get it back to where it needs to be at some point to make it back yeah, to being yeah. one of my uh, strong players. But uh, uh, it's, it's been awesome. Oh, yeah, my, really my is. pleasure. Don't hesitate. Anything you want to add to this, Jason? Well, You've been rather silent today, Jay. No, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm, I'm absorbing all the knowledge and the... It's incredible the the, the I mold him over. And, sorry, that's yeah, what it was. You, you got him. You, you got, got him me, so knocked him out thinking. with all those all those facts and figures, and he's just like, oh my gosh, I only play bass with ones and fives. I don't understand <laughs> yeah. anything musical. <laughs> yeah. That's all the same. He's not a drummer. No, I'm amazed at at the, not only the passion but the the intellect that goes into building your guitars. It's there's so much thought process there. Uh, the only question I would have is, what was it that I'm going back to the original, the beginning of all this. What was it that inspired you to start as a luthier? Um, try to win the heart of a girl. <laughs> That's what moves the world. Exactly. I knew there was a good story in there. <laughs> I love it. Well, <laughs> that changes the international borders and, uh, and starts religions. But the thing is, is I started playing guitar uh, uh, to impress a girl for sure. But uh, I was sitting on the curb waiting for her to come home from school one day, playing the guitar, and I had this revelation that if I could make a guitar, I could satisfy everything I wanted to do at one time. You know, I was busy trying to be the next Bob Dylan, but I thought maybe I could take a detour. If I could build a guitar, I could, I could build something with my hands, um, I could be involved in music, and most importantly, I could be of service to other people. And truly, uh, uh, making other people happy is what our own key to happiness. So it just seemed all perfect, and that's what inspired me. And I consider it a gift from God that it, that it came to me so clearly. But here's the thing, it didn't come to me like, oh, that's what I'm gonna be, or that's the business I'm gonna run. No, it was just the pure, simple drive to this. Making guitars could be exactly the vehicle that's right for me. So here I go again, telling you more than you wanna know. Um, what I do um, is uh, the guitar is only the vehicle for what I do. 
um, uh, what I shamelessly want to do is make the world a better place uh, uh, through example. Um, I don't I don't proselytize or promote my uh, beliefs or my faith. I want to attract other people to the consequences of the results, uh, the the good that happens from uh, uh, you know following the word, if you will. And with that, they can ask me uh, either why I'm content, why we're successful, whatever. And with that, I can help people understand how to live a, a more uh, a fulfilling life, peace of mind, and that kind of thing. That's a mouthful, but that's my goal. And guitar making was absolutely perfect for that. We deal with happy people. We generate trust and, uh, and credibility. So uh, there is the secret to my motivation. I think that's a good segue into one last section that I would like to bring up, and that's something that uh, has recently become a passion of ours, but I know has been fundamental to Santa Cruz Guitars and kind of the uh, the effort of sustainability and making sure that as you're building these great things, these instruments that go on to make great music, you're not having a, a negative uh, effect on the environment. So you guys have been very proactive in being one of those companies that pays attention to uh, sustainable harvesting of the tone woods that you use and making sure that you're still building the finest instruments out there without the sacrifice of the environment and make sure you, again, you don't prophesize it and, and make that a big part of your statement, but it has been what you guys are known for, correct? Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And again, uh, a promotion, uh, uh, no. Um, uh, example, absolutely. And uh, here he goes with his anecdote again. But, <laughs> you know, for years, I didn't talk about it. You know, I didn't talk about that. We sourced from secondary wood because it sounds better. Um, and to, to quickly debunk a myth, uh, the playing of the guitar is only one part of what makes older guitars sound better, but it's actually minor in comparison to what happens when wood ages and becomes more resonant. So we benefit hugely from using old wood and we don't have to cut trees to get it. So anyway, I didn't promote that because I didn't want to be that guy that was, um, what do they call it? Uh, you know, the greening of your image. You know, where you do a limited edition of uh, responsibly Harvard Wood so you could act like a good guy and go back to your horrendous practices <laughs> of exploitation. So I didn't talk about it, but I had a seminal meeting with uh, the Rainforest Alliance, which is kind of an even more radical thing than Greenpeace. And they said, don't be so selfish. You need to, to let people know this and show by example that you're not compromising by using this stuff. In fact, it's even better. Better. And so that's been one of my life goals also, is to set an example of doing the right thing and having it be to the benefit of everybody. So also, old wood is a blast. It's, my, it's the funnest thing I do to um, look for old wood, uh, get the stories, and I can do that full time. In fact, don't start me. I have a bit of a wood problem <laughs> Shut up. Got a heck of a collection, I would assume, right about now. Yeah, we're really big on supporting that. We've started our own Shop Sustainable, and we build a whole system that talks about, uh, you know, how we, we actually do some uh, reforestation uh, efforts in order to help out and make people understand those companies that are making that difference. We think that really is to make uh, a people really think deal. about it because it, it, it was one of those things where you could play an instrument forever and not really think where did the wood come from that built this instrument and Tom Bedell he did a TED talk that kind of turned us on originally to that but just making you think of the the instrument that I'm playing what kind of effect did that have on the environment so we're trying to pass that all along to the consumers so that we're like making them think of alright where did this come from and maybe put some pressure on some of the, the, the manufacturers just to pay more attention to that and to step by step and tree by tree maybe be a little sure. bit more sustainable in it we try. We do things every <laughs> once in a while that are okay. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. But listen, let's network uh, because I'm sure we can amplify each other's efforts by sharing information and contacts on this. And, it's, sure. and I love it. I love doing it. I'm sincere. And again, I think that's one of the last points I want to point out. 
this guy, what he just said, I am sincere. Um, I, I want to point it out one more time. I have never met a person who is so influential in this uh, industry that has been so sincere, so kind, and giving of his time. Um, I, I love the fact that he brought up all the points that me and Jeremy and Jason talk about every time we see him, is, which is when you're there, this is who you're talking to. You're not talking to somebody who's looking for somebody else to talk to. He's going to talk about what we're, you know, well, we're there to talk about guitars and love of music and and friendship and and all that. And I really enjoy. It. I thank you so much for uh, being part of today's podcast. That was uh, a big deal, especially with your traffic situation over there. Uh, you might want to think about uh, moving Santa Cruz guitars to a less traffic place, uh, Springfield, Missouri. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the name, guys. You can't do that. Is, is that true? You can't do Boy, that? Boy, do I okay. hear that all the time. All the time. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, there's this is a place with unparalleled natural beauty, a tolerance. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's real diverse, and it drives some people insane. But it's, <laughs> it's a good place for us. And I, yeah. I, so I also want to thank guys the uh, service that you do um, uh, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing and it does good wherever it lands and I think that's really the basis of our uh, if you would our friendship and our attraction to each other is our common cause in, in, in that and uh, uh, again we can amplify each other's efforts in that regard sure. as long as we remember not to try to do this alone well I got one more question for you Richard good I'm having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, did it work out with the girl? <laughs> Was the guitar the the key to it? Oh, oh, uh, oh man! What what a wonderful uh, a season of my life. Uh, it did. I got the girl. You know, through my uh, brilliant aping of <laughs> uh, that kind of thing, we formed a folk group, uh, and we we had a beautiful run, and it was it was. The hubris of youth, uh, my, um, uh, you know, my uh, self-centered boy stuff. She was way more mature than I was. And, uh, you know, end of high school, we went to school and, and we kind of uh, 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 drifted apart. Here's a beautiful thing. In COVID, after like 40-something years, um, I got uh, an email through the website uh, and she said, um, oh, I went to high school with Richard, and I was wondering if you might be able to do some work on my old D28. And look, brothers, I've been married for 50 years. <laughs> and, and as uh, uh, June Carter Cash says, um, hun, I don't care where you get your appetite as long as you eat it all. <laughs> so, anyway, we're going to start. But you know what? Once that worked, I kind of got into other interests, and, and I, I kind of let the guitar go until I ran into Happy and Artie Trom's book on uh, fingerstyle playing and introduced to tablature, and it brought me back around full circle. So when I made a guitar for Happy, it was a career goal cool. that uh, I can't tell you how fulfilling that was. And God, talk about an example. He's one of my heroes. This guy is cool, Jason. Yes, That's all there is to it. He's he's just playing cool. Really the reason we made the podcast just so people exactly. like this would sit and talk to us. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, force you guys to sit down and talk to us, and we get to pick your brain, and it's been incredible. We appreciate you taking the time, Richard. Absolutely. We'll do it again soon. That's great. Um, I, I don't want to run this into the ground, but I talked about uh, promotion uh, 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 is not my style's attraction, and uh, I don't do this alone. And, and if anything, uh, the shine you see from what I do or what I say is, is a reflection of my faith. And if anybody wants to talk about that in a non-business context, I'm there for That's you. That's awesome. That's very, very cool. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. This is everything. <laughs> let, oh, we'll, we'll schedule it. We'll, we'll make this a, a regular morning yeah. routine. I, I can't wait to find more stories from you because, I, I again, what a what a what wealth of knowledge of, yeah. of a boutique guitar building. Yeah, I, I 
I am that guy. You ask me a question, I want to tell you the whole history while I'm shaking my cane at the kids and telling them to get off. <laughs> get off you you earned it. You've earned it for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate so much, and we will be talking to you soon, Richard. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Okay, buddies. I look forward to the next time. Go with thank God. You. <laughs> Richard Hoover, guys. That was awesome. Yeah. Richard Hoover. So many stories. We didn't even get to the fact that he invented a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and, uh, it's not the a same. Large, a large Interesting fact, though. There is another Richard water. Hoover that was a physicist, a very famous physicist. When I was looking up his Wikipedia, Can you say I physicist came a few that. times? Physicist. Wow. That's anyway. uh, really interesting, Jay. That was great. But yeah. There, <laughs> when you talk about the... the uh, the breadth of boutique guitar building, and we, you've mentioned this before, that we're kind of in that golden age of really well-built instruments. And it's because of people like him that kind of kept pushing the boundaries of what can we get out of a guitar. Like I said, before then, it was just kind of, the, can we build a loud, bassy instrument? And then these guys, and Dana has had these same conversations where they're like, how can we make this more control where we control the tones that this instrument is producing and the amount of experimentation that those guys go through it's not a quick thing like you do an experiment and you see the result instantly you got to build this guitar put it all together string it up and then see what change did that what effect did that little change i made have and do that repeatedly over and over and over to get to where these guys are and now these new builders are able to take some of that knowledge and, and experience that they developed over the years to create these exceptional instruments yeah that's the scary part if you think about this because there, there's different ages there's the Lord Lore and the CF Martins sure. that, that started all this, you know, and they were, they were doing some incredible pioneer work there. Mm -hmm. And then there was like a you know an age after that where guys like Richard came out and all these guys Dana, Dana and, and all these guys and just just turned it just completely refined it past that point to another era of building and now i believe we're in a new era where it's it's taking all that knowledge again and just there's no telling where it's going to go yeah, it's, and it's, all it's, for the customer who just hangs it on their wall <laughs> exactly. it's going to be uh, really cool i think uh, what chase was just saying there there's a cool parallel to like that example you had of these guys that were kind of doing it by themselves and the, the lone people out there uh music has that like when bluegrass was developed you had the earl scruggs that was the lone guy out there that figured out how to do this three finger banjo oh, yeah. and and, and flat picking guitars, a couple those guys that, yeah. that had that, and then all of a sudden, because of them, you this whole thing blossomed out of there, and people, Bela Fleck comes along, and then all of a sudden, there's this new generation following up where all these banjo players that are coming out now are just all standing on those shoulders. Same thing happened in the, the instrument building where you had these lone wolves out there kind of redefining it, and then all because of that, and in the beer industry with the microbreweries, you had you know, Sam Adams. Back to yeah. Beer. Yeah. You had these guys that just kind of started this thing, and then people just built upon that, and it's... But to John's now point, now AI is going to get involved. Yeah, and we're exactly. all in trouble. <laughs> to, J to John's point, though, it, it isn't doesn't just benefit the boutique guitars. No, uh, we we know that for a fact. We see it every day that that the consistency in the entry level and even above that is better. It's, it's there's better. we've never been in an era like this where you can find the quality of an ins instrument at the price point that we can see these days. And it is all because of those guys pushing those boundaries because if it was left up, left up to Martin and Gibson and all those guys, we'd still be getting some pretty subpar run of the mill stuff that, Ooh, that Jace just don't I'm, I'm I'm there was an out. era before these there guys really I know raised I know. the bar that they were kind of especially like, during the era that gonna, he's talking about that yeah. uh, set mid 70s era exactly uh, was all part of that problem uh, for, for all companies the, the manufacturers they're going to buy them anyway why do we have to put that yeah. much time and effort into it let's yeah. just keep well, making well it's more competition of them. it's yeah. just raising all boats There's, uh, it doesn't even come out I'm, I'm not even going to say they intentionally were doing it it's just I really wish I would have thought push boundaries to have asked Richard though the question of what do you think of the fact that you put all this time and energy into guitars that a bunch of them now are just art pieces that sit on walls? <laughs> I wonder wonder what he feels about that. He probably doesn't think about that. <laughs> he tries would, not to I think about not. that. He's, he probably moves on to the next guitar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He gets them in the hands of great players. And, and no, they do. Well, I, I say that because we see it a lot. We get a lot of instruments that go to great players and people who really appreciate every bit. And even people who aren't great players that appreciate yeah. every bit of what these do. Those guys that are hanging on but, the wall are probably really appreciating but the, then every yeah. once in a while we get the one that you're just sitting here like oh my god this is one of the greatest instruments i've ever played and yet i know this is about to just sit on a wall it'll never play <laughs> it's never uh, gonna make music there's oh nothing we 
can do other nope. than sell them. That's uh, right. Can, and give him some lessons. I can take his money and invest it in some more instruments for people we that are going to We need to introduce him. him to a girl, because apparently that's not the secret. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's the right. absolute push. That'll make anybody play. <laughs> anyway, well, that I, was incredible. That was fun, guys. I appreciate it. Um, I thought my segue into the show was uh, okay, no. but you guys <laughs> no. disagreed, so it's let me work so on my long. segue I out. I don't even, yeah, uh, I don't even yeah. remember what you talked about anymore. Well, I'll I talk. don't even care. Good to see you guys. Uh, Richard didn't what mention if, my mustache the whole time. I was a little surprised. It must have been the lag or Very something. strange. Well, so, couldn't see it in the... Uh, you must, the you probably have to get on to the... See uh, if it would like yeah. focus yeah. his attention. But yeah, I do one of these. I don't think he... I don't think he cared. Nobody cares. All right. We'll we'll, we'll do this guys. again. Yeah, uh, next we'll do it week. on the next uh, episode. So yeah, thank you guys for watching back, so. and yeah. listening. I said watching, mostly listening. Yeah, thank you all for. There's uh, a video podcast of this, but yeah. uh, let's do that. Yeah. Let's thank the people for listening yep. uh, out there. Thank you for sharing it. I can't believe how big. Please this do that. Gotten. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's all because you guys shared it with a thousand of your friends a every thousand. time. A thousand makes a thousand, and a thousand. It's like yeah. a chain mail. Yeah, I like that. chain letter. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. The Acoustic Shop knows people. Handmade by Trent Pruitt, Hinkley Hinkleston, and Jason Chapman for The Acoustic Shop. Theme song written and performed by Ofer Corin. And please remember to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.